Hey there chemists, in this lesson we're going to look at a handful of reactions that we'll be able to use for syntheses involving aldehydes and ketones. Uh, some of them are related, some of them are rather unique. Uh, there's four of them, they're mostly good for reaction mechanism practice and perfecting your curved arrow skills. The first one is called a conjugate addition, and I want you to add to your notes, it's actually with cuprates. These are organometallic reagents we learned about in Orgo 1, and they look like this. They're a nucleophilic hydrocarbon uh, attached to a copper, written like so. It's actually a copper anion. And you might remember from Orgo 1 that cuprates do not react with aldehydes and ketones, uh, as opposed to Grignards and Lithiates, which do. So what are we doing over here? Well, this is a very specific type of uh, ketone with an unsaturation, a double bond, on the alpha and beta carbon. Alpha just means one away from the carbonyl carbon, and then beta means one away from that. You would, in theory, have gamma, delta, etc. as you go down the carbon chain. So this is an alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone that reacts with this. And the product is just a substituted ketone. So specifically, it makes a new bond at that beta position, quite far from where the ketone stays put in the end. So it's actually a very short mechanism. If we start with the alpha beta unsaturated ketone, remember cuprates, like all organometallics, we're going to abbreviate as just nucleophilic sources of carbon. And instead of attacking the ketone carbon, that does not happen. But what does happen, specifically with a cuprate, is it reacts with the beta carbon. That is electrophilic because I can draw a resonance contributor of the intermediate that you're about to see. So that's a new bond between R and the beta carbon. And then we have a ketone with a negative charge right on the alpha carbon. And this is resonance stabilized. We can bring that negative charge to make what looks like an alkene and send the pi bond up to the oxygen. And then you get oops, an intermediate that looks like that. This is called an enolate. We're actually going to see a whole unit later on in this course that's devoted to the chemistry of enolates. How do we get from the enolate to our substituted ketone? Uh, there's just an aqueous workup. Some source of proton will trap that enolate. You bring that negative charge back down to reform the carbonyl, and that picks up a proton. Just like most organometallic reactions, we have an aqueous workup. You might go, why doesn't this just pick up the H plus right there and give me an alcohol? Well, that would give you an enol, in theory, and you know that those tautomerized ketones anyway. Uh, also, thermodynamically, the carbonyl is simply more stable. So that's the simple mechanism of how a cuprate works. So and we can make cuprates from uh, organo uh, organohalides or other organometallics. Okay, the next one is called a cyanohydrin formation. It also is the reaction of a ketone. And it specifically is this. This is a cyanohydrin. It's a great way to add one carbon. Great way to add one carbon. And you can see how that works. We have one new carbon here from our, our nitrile group. We don't know how to functionalize nitriles yet, uh, but we will see that they're pretty versatile. So. Let's start with a ketone. And uh, hydrocyanic acid, actually you can just draw it as if it's a proton donor. It's a weak acid, but we're going to use it to protonate our ketone. And then cyanide, which is negatively charged on the carbon, will form a bond with that oxonium. Remember, this is an oxonium from our first lesson in this unit on acetals and ketals. 
And that's how you get the cyanohydrin, very short. One thing that's useful for cyanohydrins, I'll just show it here since there's so much space, is you can reduce a cyanohydrin with hydrogenations. H2 and a metal catalyst will reduce the carbon-carbon triple bond down to a single bond. And this is one way that's rather useful to make primary amines. We actually don't know much amine chemistry, but it's coming up pretty quickly. So we'll just throw that in there as a useful way to make a primary amine uh, and extend your, your original ketone. Okay, there's two others. Uh, the, the third one is a Bayer Villager oxi oxidation. This one uses a reagent that we've seen before, uh, but not for this purpose. It uses a per acid, MCPBA, which you might remember makes epoxides, those three-membered rings, from alkenes. However, if we have a ketone instead of an alkene, this is the first method we know to make an ester. It inserts an oxygen in between the ketone carbon and the, the carbon right next to it, the alpha. So we take this ethyl and we move it outside of a new oxygen. The mechanism involves your ketone, whoops, just a regular ketone, reacting with MCPBA. MCPBA stands for metachloroperoxybenzoic acid and it looks like a oxidized carboxylic acid. The metachloro part is just an aromatic ring or an aryl group so I'm just going to abbreviate it as AR. First up you protonate the ketone to make an oxonium And then you have a per carboxylate, which acts as a nucleophile and attacks that oxonium. And there we go, a very oxidized intermediate. Now this will actually collapse and spit out what looks like the oxonium of an ester. I'll actually show you the product first, because then I want you to try and figure out the arrow pushing for how this intermediate becomes this precursor to the product. There is a byproduct, and it's the carboxylate. So for practice, I want you to hit pause and see if you can add curved arrows right on top of this intermediate to show how it breaks down into these two pieces. Okay, so remember when you're trying to figure out mechanisms and add your own curved arrows, especially when you're given the products, uh, you just have to look at what bonds break and what bonds form and show curved arrows to indicate how that happens. Uh, it doesn't really matter what order you notice them, as long as you get all the arrows in at the end. One thing I notice is that this oxygen-oxygen bond breaks. That makes sense. The oxygen-oxygen single bond is notoriously weak. So we're actually going to have one curved arrow that simply shows the breakage of that bond. The negative charge on the oxygen shows me which direction it goes. The other bonds that break and form are a little bit trickier to see. We form a carbon-oxygen double bond between that carbon and that oxygen. So we're going to bring a pair of electrons from that oxygen down to form that pi bond. And after that, there's only one more curved arrow, and it will simultaneously show how this carbon-carbon bond breaks and this carbon-oxygen bond forms. And we show that all at once with this bond breaking and forming a bond with that oxygen. What that curved arrow right there shows is that this carbon-carbon bond is no longer there, and this ethyl group is now attached to this oxygen, which is exactly what we have right here. This is the key step of the Bayer Villager, and I'm going to make a note about this. In the Bayer Villager, in B slash V, the larger alkyl group migrates. you'll notice that we could have done the same thing 
except have the methyl migrate and put an oxygen to the left of the carbon-oxygen bond of this structure and move the methyl over. But it happens to be the larger group that migrates. Uh, there's a good practice problem that you'll see that has you draw a Newman projection to explain this, why the existence of this intermediate actually has uh, this whole group anti to the ethyl in a Newman projection that looks down the carbon-oxygen bond, but that's more than we need at this junction of the class, so I'll just say it's the larger group that migrates. To finish up the mechanism, we're actually one step away from the product. We can actually use these two species that we have, and that carboxylate can act as a weak base to take away your extra H, and that will actually give you the ester, that's our main product, and your byproduct is just the carboxylic acid. So all that we did was deliver an oxygen from MCPBA into the ketone and turn it into an ester. Uh, interesting mechanism, which I think is why it makes for a good practice problem in this unit, and it's also the first way we have to make esters. Okay, the last one is a complement to a reaction you've seen before. This takes a ketone and turns it into an alkane. This reaction transformation you actually have seen before in the Clemenson reduction. We saw that with lots of aromatic chemistry. Remember, that's something like uh, uh, benzene attached to a ketone uh, using HCl with an amalgam of a mixture that's uh, zinc and mercury that will give you the alkane. So we've seen that reaction before, but sometimes we have molecules that are acid sensitive. So there is a base variation of this reaction. It's called the Wolf-Kishner reduction. It involves a molecule that's sometimes used as rocket propellant, uh, NH2, NH2, in the presence of hydroxides, in the presence of base. Remember on the days of doing acetal and ketal mechanisms, we said that those were acidic, so we saw largely positive charges. Now we're going to see plenty of negative charges in this mechanism. This is the lengthiest mechanism in this lesson, but let's walk through it. Starting with your ketone and the hydrazine molecule, which is NH2, NH2. Uh, the hydrazine acts as a nucleophile and attacks the ketone. Remember, carbonyl oxygens are quite electrophilic. So we temporarily have an intermediate that looks like this. You do a quick H plus transfer. That's just our abbreviation to denote that there are acid base steps happening. It's actually quite possible that you have the conjugate base of hydrazine in the beginning here. but we'll show this under neutral intermediate conditions. And since we are in base, hydroxide can actually act as a leaving group. So we're gonna have it leave. That should look very strange, but under basic conditions, you can have a hydroxide get kicked out. And under such basic conditions, we'll actually hardly have any of this, uh, what looks like positively charged intermediate for any length of time, but we're gonna take that extra H away and get a neutral, what's called hydrazone. This is the key intermediate that's formed in the Wolf-Kishner. This is called a hydrazone. It's really similar to the chemistry we're gonna see later on involving amine chemistry to make them uh, to make amines from ketones and aldehydes. We are not done. There's plenty of this mechanism left. Under excess base, hydroxide will act as a base and take away one of those hydrozone hydrogens. That will turn this into the conjugate base of that. Now there's a negative charge in the nitrogen. This is resonance stabilized, and we can actually get that negative charge to become a nitrogen-nitrogen double bond 
and stick a negative charge right on the carbon. It's a lone pair negative right on that carbon. And let's pause for a second and just check in with our overall product. What are we trying to get to? We're trying to get to the alkane. So we want to get two more hydrogens on this carbon right here where we used to have a carbon oxygen double bond. We now have two hydrogens and we have a negative charge on that carbon currently and we are, we are swimming an aqueous base. So we have plenty of water around that can act as a proton source. So we're going to put an H on right now from a water molecule. There's one of the H's. Now what's left, we have to get another H on this carbon. That means we need to have this whole group leave. And we can get that to happen pretty quickly because we just made a hydroxide from the water molecule. So we have hydroxide, which can take away another H. History will repeat itself. What we saw up here is essentially happening again. And you get an intermediate. Still with that nitrogen-nitrogen double bond and a negative charge on that nitrogen. And we can even repeat the arrow pushing we saw back here except this was a resonance contributor. Here, we're actually gonna use that negatively charged nitrogen to form a nitrogen molecule. Remember, nitrogen as a molecule is an excellent uh, leaving group, and here it just becomes a very stable gaseous product. That will throw a negative charge right on that carbon. And now the nitrogen isn't even attached. It's a triply bonded nitrogen molecule which, as you should know, is a gas, and it's very stable. We are still in the presence of water. We actually made a water molecule a moment ago, so we have an equivalent of it. So water can act as another weak base and repeat that previous step to put an H on that carbon right where we want it. Okay. So... The lengthiest mechanism by far was that Wolf Kishner, mostly as an exercise in practicing your arrow pushing. Uh, so now we know how to reduce ketones down to alkanes, convert them into esters with the Bayer Villager oxidation. We can add a carbon using a cyanohydrin, uh, or in theory add many carbons off of a ketone in a conjugate addition.